The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Welcome to PEI's master class, Carbon Cycling in the Arctic Tundra, Source or Sink. Thank you for joining us to learn more about polar science and education. My name is Betty Trummel, and I will be the moderator for tonight's class. This course will look at the effects of climate change on Arctic tundra and how a warming Arctic will impact global climate. We'll discuss the role of permafrost in global carbon cycling and explore the movement of carbon dioxide between tundra ecosystems and the atmosphere as it's taken up through photosynthesis and released into the atmosphere through respiration. We will focus on how climate change is affecting these carbon cycle processes and how the carbon balance of the Arctic will change in the future. The Masterclass series is designed with two audiences in mind, educators who want to build their science knowledge and researchers who are interested in improving their science communication skills. This class will provide a deeper understanding of ways scientists and educators work together. You can learn more about PEI on our website, polareducators.org. One, one thing, one, I just need yes. to, to um, please show your screen. Share your screen with us. Isn't it? It's not working? Oh, sorry. Sure. That's okay. Okay. Is it now showing my screen? Yes. Okay, so I'm just going to go back here and show the first that gives the title of our webinar tonight, Carbon Cycling in the Arctic Tundra, Source or Sink. For more information about Polar Educators International, you can go to our, our website, polareducator.org. And here is our vision statement, and one of the ways PEI is working to meet the goals of our vision statement is to sponsor master classes like this one, focused on the needs of a dual audience educators and researchers. We're excited to present the class tonight and we'll have another one scheduled for September of 2018. You'll be hearing more about that. Uh, it'll be announced in June or July. The next topic will be recognizing the Bentha community and understanding how climate change affects its structure and its function. So tonight, Throughout the webinar, you can write your questions in the questions box. We'll try to post some, some of them at the end of each one of the presentations. Your questions will only come to me as a moderator. We'll try to fit in as many as time allows. Any unanswered questions from the webinar or new questions can be posed and answered in the discussion group in our Google community, and that is from the 12th through the 30th of April. It's about a two-week period following the webinar. Our first presenter tonight will be Dr. Susan Natale. Dr. Natale is a scientist at the Woods Hole Research Center, studying the response of Arctic ecosystems to a changing environment and the impacts of these changes on global climate. Her research examines feedbacks on global carbon cycling from permafrost thaw and impacts of fire and landscape characteristics on permafrost vulnerability. She's an active member and synthesis lead in the Permafrost Carbon Network, an international network of scientists working to incorporate impacts of permafrost, permafrost thaw into global climate models. Dr. Natalia has presented her research at the United Nations Climate Change Con Conferences in Bonn and Paris, and she has been actively communicating permafrost carbon research to policymakers, media, and public audiences. Dr. Natalia is also passionate about educating the next generation of scientists. She has collaborated with John Wood and other teachers to bring her research to K through 12 students, and she is a faculty member of the Polaris Project, an undergraduate Arctic research program. Following Sue's presentation, we'll have our second speaker, our educator, Mr. John Wood. John has been part of the Polar Trek program, matching educators with scientists to provide real-time field experiences and opportunities for science communication. John is a STEM teacher and polar educator at Talbert Middle School in California. Since 1978, he has worked in both polar regions, engaging students and the general public in outreach activities and presentations. He has worked with Sue for the past six years, collaborating on carbon cycling in the tundra and developing lessons and educational activities aimed at creating awareness for students 
and public audiences. The activities that John introduces in this webinar will be available in the members area of the PEI website during the online discussion class. They will also be shared on the PEI group Facebook page and in the discussion group following the webinar. A few reminders about the master class. We'd like you to join the online discussion as part of our Google com community, and that will take place between the 12th and 30th of April. Please be active in that Google community. We want to hear your feedback and questions and your ideas about incorporating this science into classrooms. To earn a PEI certificate of participation, either take part in the live webinar or the archived one. Introduce yourself in the discussion forum in the Google community and take part in the discussions regularly over the two-week period. See the detailed syllabus on the website and complete the pre- and post-surveys. And we thank you for taking part in this masterclass series. I'm going to switch the screen now to Sue's screen so she can get started. Enjoy. Hey, great. Thank you, Betty. Can everyone hear me? And you should be switching to your screen, Sue. Um, there we go. Did it just switch? It should be ready to go. Can I can see it now? Yeah, it's not. For some reason, it won't stay as a presentation. Okay, let me just get myself set up a second here. I actually used the sidebar and did it that way just because the same thing. I couldn't get it to stay as a presentation. Yeah, okay. So let me just make this. Let me just get myself set up one second. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, well, thank you for the um, invitation to be here and for the introduction. And um, I'm just going to talk to you for a little bit about the research that I do um, and also the work that I've done with John Wood. Um, so uh, my name is Sue Natale. I um, work at the Woods Hole Research Center. So the Woods Hole Research Center is a climate change and, um, research center that's located in Cape Cod, so in the northeast of the U.S. Um, and I've been working in the Arctic for about 10 years. I work a lot in Alaska and I also work in Siberia. So this is a picture of um, a thawing hill slope in northeast Siberia where I work. Okay, so um, John and I have been working together for um, quite some time, I guess six or seven years now. So we started working with each other in 2011 um, through Polar Trek. And our first expedition was at um, a research experiment located in Alaska. Let me just make this a little bit smaller. Just gonna cut off. Okay. Um, we worked again in the field in 2012. In 2014, um, we worked in Siberia together, and then once again in 2017, we worked in Alaska. And it's been a really great experience for me to see how the research that I do can be translated into lesson plans um, for students in John's classes and also his, beyond his classes. Um, and one thing that's also been really helpful for me in working with John is that he's helped me to um, communicate my science in ways that are accessible outside of the very specific scientific community that I work in. And it's something that I is really important to me that I continue to work on. Okay, so what I'm going to talk about today is I'm going to talk about Arctic and permafrost region ecosystems. Um, then I'll talk a little bit about climate change in the Arctic, how climate change is impacting tundra, and the feedbacks on global climate. So what do these changes mean for the rest of us in other parts of the world? So first, I just want to um, bring up this slide, which says, what is the Arctic? And it's an important point because different people define the Arctic differently. Um, so if you see in this picture, so this is an image of the Earth looking down um, onto the North Pole. So it's a little bit of a different view um, than we normally see. 
But um, if you look at the areas that are shaded in gray, these are areas that are underlain by permafrost, which I'll talk more about in a minute. So that's one definition of the Arctic. Um, another definition is the Arctic Circle. So this is just um, about latitude, between latitude 65 and 66. Um, and that's this blue line. If you look at the yellow line, this is, you know, tr tree line. Um, there's the Arctic can be defined by temperature. So this red dash line is the 10 degrees Celsius isotherm. So anything north of this, um, the average July temperature is less than 10 degrees Celsius. Um, so some of these seem somewhat arbitrary. To me, the one that makes the most sense is to define the Arctic by areas that are underlain by permafrost. Um, so that's what I'll be talking about today. So let me just tell you what permafrost is first of all. So um, again, this is a, another location in, in Siberia. Um, a lot of times when we think of the Arctic, if we think of just the area that's defined by tree line, so you know, many of us think of the Arctic as just Arctic tundra, but there's actually many areas in the Arctic that have trees, as you can see in this picture. Um, so permafrost is ground that remains frozen for two or more consecutive years. Um, much of the permafrost has been frozen for thousands of years, tens of thousands of years. Um, and this, the permafrost in this picture is you know, 40,000 years old. Um, so it's, it's any material that's in that ground. So it can contain ice wedges. So the shiny areas that you see in this picture underneath the ground, that's ground ice, um, rocks, um, animal bones, partly decomposed plant parts, all of this is part of the permafrost. So permafrost is, the definition is really a thermal state. Um, the area above the permafrost is called the active layer. So this is the ground that thaws every summer during the growing season and then refreezes again in the winter. And this is the area where mo much of the biological activity takes place. So this is where you find plant roots um, and, and, and microbes that are actively breaking down material that's found in the soil. And this is just another picture. This is um, John Wood, and, and we were in the permafrost tunnel, um, which is located near Fairbanks, Alaska. Um, and this is a really nice picture because it gives you an idea of what it's like underneath the ground. You know, if you look at this, if you look at this last picture, you know, this scientist standing on top of a top of this hill slope has no idea what's you have no idea what's below you when you're walking through this forest but you get on the ground you get a really good idea and you can see this massive ice wedge that's surrounding john in this picture um and you know i really love going to this permafrost tunnel because it really reminds me about you know what the what the impacts can be um if the ground temperatures increase and the ground thaws and this ice starts to melt um, fortunately the tunnel is um they, they're running refrigerant to keep it to keep it frozen. Okay, so I want to just talk a little bit about permafrost region ecosystems. So Arctic ecosystems or permafrost region ecosystems. When we think of um, these ecosystems, a lot of us think about a picture like this. So something that's very flat. It looks pretty homogeneous. Um, and, and this is a classic picture of Arctic tundra. This is Arctic tundra in northeast Siberia. Um, it's actually not as homogeneous when you get when you get up close, um, but you can have air, upland areas like this. Um, but then we ha also have other tundra areas that look very very different. So this is an area in southwest Alaska. The tundra can be quite wet, um, pretty much this patchwork of you know terrestrial landscapes and aquatic landscapes. Um, the other nice thing you see in this picture is along the edges you see these two burned areas. So, you know, we don't think about tundra burning, but um, there actually are fires in the tundra, even in a place like this that's very wet. Um, and that's really important for the ecosystems and also for global climate. Um, but as you saw in the other pictures, there are also trees um, in permafrost ecosystems. And this is in a place in Alaska, and we have a few black spruce trees. Um, what much of the Siberian Arctic is um, dominated by larch trees, so there are a lot of trees that are underlain by permafrost. Um, and then I just want to show a few pictures if you look up close, what's the vegetation in these areas? Um, so anyone who's walked around the tundras probably um, knows these um, land vegetation forms very intimately. This is, this is referred to as a tussock, so it's a, it's a sedge. 
that grows in these kind of bundles here and you, and you tend to trip over them and, and they're pretty common in Arctic tundra. Um, you also see a lot of moss. So on the left, this is an insectivorous plant that grows inside the, you know, in these sphagnum moss patches. On the right is lichen, which is really common. It's important um, forage species for caribou in the winter. Um, but there are also tall shrubs. So on the left, this is John um, walking through um, a tundra area and then areas that are dominated by grasses. And if you look at the picture on the right, you see um, where this researcher is standing, there's a lot of grasses, but you go a really short distance and then the ecosystem completely changes. Um, so the Arctic ecosystems are really, really varied, um, but they're all defined by, to some extent, and adapted to these very low temperatures that we find across the region. Um, However, um, temperatures are increasing, as I'm sure um, most people are aware of, um, and they're increasing quite a bit more in the polar regions and especially in the Arctic. And so this is just one snapshot. This is February 2016, and you see all these very dark maroon areas. Um, these are areas where the temperature has increased between 4 and 11.5 degrees Celsius. Um, so that's quite extreme warming for the winter. and this has been, you know, every winter for the past several years has been has been really, really warm. Um, you can refer to this as amplified warming in the Arctic. There's a number of reasons why it's warmer in the Arctic than in other areas. Um, one of them is a, or is a result of melting of sea ice. And so these, because the ice is gone, these darkened oceans are now absorbing more of the sun's energy. Um, so as a result of these warmer temperatures in the Arctic, we're seeing um, increasing temperatures, but there's also a lot of melting going on. So this is an example of, um, this is called an Inanna Ice Classic, and this is a competition. You can buy a raffle ticket for it each year, and the prize is in the, about $300,000. And people, um, local people, um, guess when they think the river will break up. Well, it's also provided a really good record of river breakup over the past hundred years. And you see that the river's been breaking up earlier and earlier and earlier. Um, so that's kind of a local example, but we're seeing these patterns of, you know, increasing melting um, across the Arctic. Um, when I think of climate change in the Arctic and the impacts on the rest of the planet, I think of these big three changes. So in the upper left corner, this is, this is what I told you about. Um, how when the sea ice is melting, you see these dark areas of open ocean and they absorb a lot more of the Earth's energy. Um, glacial melt is leading to um, flooding and, and increased sea level rises across the planet. And then the bottom picture is of permafrost thaw. And that's what I'm gonna be talking about today and that's the focus of my research. So, um, so this is a picture in the, yeah, sorry. Um, yeah, so the picture in the back is a map of the distribution of permafrost, and you can see it's a little hard to see um, because this text is in front of it, but much of the Russian Arctic is, it, the Rus is Russia is underlain by permafrost. So it's really widespread. It comprises about 25% of the Northern Hemisphere land area is underlain by permafrost. And we expect by 2100 that 30 to 70% of the permafrost, surface permafrost will be thawed. So, um, that's a lot of um, area that there is permafrost where there no longer will be permafrost. And that really wide range is um, driven by our, how much fossil fuels we emit now. So if we continue on our current trajectory, we'll lose 70% of our permafrost. Um, thawing of the permafrost has a lot of important implications. Um, so, you know, it has a big impact on ecosystems. So these are pictures of um, the left is a forest in Russia, the right is a forest in Alaska. And you see these trees that are bent over, they're sometimes referred to as drunken forests. And this is happening because those ice wedges that, I sh that you saw uh, in that picture when John was in the permafrost tunnel, when you have ice underneath the soil um, and the soil warms, that ice melts, you get ground collapse. Um, so you can have ice in the form of those giant ice wedges. It could be in different ice types of ice lenses. Um, so this ground collapse, it's also called thermokarst. Um, it has important implications for ecosystems. You see in these pictures, these trees are falling down. Um, it can cause areas of the ground to get very wet. So some vegetation dies, and then you have new vegetation coming in. Um, permafrost thaw also has important implications for infrastructure. Um, so this is a number of communities and, and throughout the Arctic are be, being impacted 
um, as a, because of permafrost thaw. Um, but what I want to talk about is how um, warming affects carbon cycling. Um, so just a quick um, review of carbon cycling. So there's a couple important processes. One is decomposition. So this is breakdown of organic matter that's stored in soils by microbes. And they break down that organic matter. Um, they use that as an energy source. And in the process of breaking down this organic sources of carbon, um, they release greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide, and methane. The other important process is photosynthesis. So this is um, plants taking up carbon dioxide through photosynthesis. So um, decomposition releases greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. Photosynthesis results causes it to be taken up. Um, so when there's more photosynthesis than decomposition and also respiration by plants, when there's more that's being taken up, we say the system is a carbon sink. So that means it's storing carbon. So the Arctic has been a carbon sink for tens of thousands of years. So that's why there's a lot of carbon that's in the soils. When there's more carbon being released um, as a result of decomposition, we say that the ecosystem is a carbon source. And so we have a couple hypotheses about what will happen in the Arctic. One is that um, these warming temperatures and changes in the soil will cause plants to grow more. And so maybe the Arctic will take up more carbon from the atmosphere. And the other possibility is that these warming soils will increase microbial activity, resulting in a release of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. Um, so this is one of the big questions um, that formulates my research and a number of scientists who are working in the Arctic. So now I'm just going to talk a little bit about how we study carbon cycling in the Arctic. And this is a picture of the experiment um, that I worked on um, that John came up to Alaska and we worked on for a couple of years. And I'll tell you a little bit about this, but just first, here's an aerial image of this experiment. These long lines are boardwalk, and this could connects different replicated components of this experiment. And what we did in this experiment is that we wanted to warm the air and warm the soil and find out what happened um, to carbon cycling in this system. So we warmed the air with these little chambers and that resulted, they're like mini greenhouses, and that resulted in an increase in air temperature by one degree Celsius. We warmed the soils by using these snow fences and the snow fences trap snow, the snow insulates the soils and it results in soil temperatures being about three degrees Celsius warmer and it also, caused the ground to thaw. So that was a really important component of this experiment. Um, and we took a number of different types of measurements to find out what's happening with the plants and what's happening with the greenhouse gases that's coming out of the ecosystem. So just a few results. Um, one of the things that we saw immediately, which was really surprising to me, is that the warm plants greened earlier. So these are plants that had their soils warm because they had this increased snow insulation and also that had the air warm. And this is just a picture from one day in May of the same plant species. Um, this is a dwarf birch. And on the left, you see one that wasn't warmed. On the one on the right, it was warmed. And it's, I mean, it's quite obvious how different they are. The fact that this plant has green leaves so much earlier suggests that it's probably taking up, you know, you're going to get more carbon dioxide taken up when you warm because the plants have green leaves and so they're able to photosynthesize. Um, and this is a graph from that experiment. So that was just an example. Um, Betulinana is the dwarf birch. So the x-axis is just three different species and soil warmed are the, um, the treatment where we added the snow and we warmed soils and thawed the ground. Um, the yellow triangles are air warmed and the circles is no warming. And so this is just day of year when the plants started to green. And you see in all these three instances, when we warm the air and really when we warm the soil, these plants were, were green earlier. And they also were green later. So um, the figure on the left, this is um, one of the species, um, the, the tussock that I showed you. Um, it stayed green later um, in these plots where the soils were warmed, so the blue squares. And then the figure on the right is NDVI. So this is a measure of plant greenness. So at the end of the growing season, the plants in the, you know, at the end of September, the plants in the plots that were warmed um, were all quite a bit greener. Okay, but the question is, so this suggests that there's gonna be more carbon dioxide taken up. Um, but the question is, you know, what does this mean for carbon dioxide fluxes? So we can measure carbon dioxide fluxes directly. And we do this using these boxes. And these boxes have 
Um, you see these metal arms on them. Um, they're connected to a compressor air system and a computer, and the computer tells these, these doors to open and close. When the doors are closed, then we basically have contained this small little ecosystem in this box. And then we you know, pump gas to an analyzer and it measures over time what's happening to the carbon dioxide in that little box. So if you look at the figure on the left, this is an example of a graph um, when the box was closed during the day. And what you see is the CO2 concentration is going down because the plants are active and they're taking up carbon dioxide. Um, the figure on the right is um, a picture of nighttime and this is subarctic so we do get some darkness here so this is July at 1:20 in the morning and you see that the CO2 concentration is going up and this is because the plants are no longer photosynthesizing but microbes and plants are respiring so they're giving off carbon dioxide okay so you know we take these measurements these measurements are happening throughout the growing season they're happening throughout the day um, and with these measurements we can come up with a cumulative number ask just how much carbon is being taken up throughout the growing season. Um, so this is an example of the data from one year. This is from 2011. Um, and I'll just walk through these three different graphs. So again, the blue is the soil warming and ground thaw. Um, the green yellow is where we warm the air and the white is with no warming. And so the figure on the left that says gross primary productivity. So this is the gross amount of carbon dioxide that is being taken up by the ecosystem. And you can see the blue bar is the, is the highest. And so there's an increase in carbon dioxide um, when we warmed the soils and also when we warmed the air. So this is a good thing. You know, this suggests that when we increase um, temperatures in the Arctic, there's gonna be carbon dioxide taken out of the air. Um, we look at ecosystem respiration. So this is the amount of carbon dioxide that's being released into the atmosphere by both plants and microbes. And again, we see that there is an increase in respiration. But this increase in respiration in the blue plots and the soil warmed plots, it's not as big as the amount of carbon that's being taken up by plants. And so when we combine these two graphs, this figure on the right is net ecosystem exchange. It's just combining these two directions of carbon dioxide. And what this tells us is that during the growing season, the system was a net carbon sink. So um, it's taking up 50 grams of carbon in the plots that weren't warmed, but it's doubling that in the plots that were warm. So we're taking up two times more carbon um, when we warm this ecosystem. So we refer to that as a, a negative feedback. So it means that it's removing negative feedback in climate. So removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Okay, um, but this is just the growing season and there's a long period of time um, that we call winter in the Arctic. And we generally often don't refer to four seasons. It just pretty much goes summer for you know anywhere from three to five months, a couple weeks of the shoulder season, spring and fall. And then pretty much the rest of the time is, 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 is winter. Um, and there's microbial activity in the winter. So even though the plants have shut down, the microbes are still active. And so the microbes are still you know, respiring, they're breaking down carbon that's in the soil and they're giving off carbon dioxide. And we found that there was a 60% increase in winter respiration. So this figure looks a little bit different because now this is net ecosystem exchange. So the net amount of carbon dioxide that's moving between the ecosystem and the air, and it's negative here. So that negative means that the ecosystem is a carbon source. So what we see is that even our ambient plots are a carbon source, but we're doubling the amount of carbon that's being released to the atmosphere when we warm the soils. And we're not seeing that when we just warm the air because the air warming was just happening during the growing season. So it wasn't impacting what was happening during the winter. Um, so this is really important. And even this, you know, this ambient plot being a source was really surprising because the Arctic has been a carbon sink for many years. Okay, so this is what's happening at this one experiment. Um, and the question is, what does this mean for global climate? Okay, so I talked a little bit about um, the carbon that's in permafrost, and maybe I should have showed you first, but this is what the carbon looks like. The carbon is just partly, um, partially decayed plant and animal parts. And so this is, this looks like a branch. This we found two meters down in frozen soil. Um, you can see the left part of the screen. This is just partly decomposed sphagnum moss. 
And so, you know, the ground is so cold and it's frozen that this, the plants die and this stuff never decomposes. Um, and this is another picture. If you look in the background, these are very, these very fine roots and these are like 40,000 years old and they're only still in the soil. They would have decomposed um, and broken down in a place that was warmer. Um, so in order to understand how permafrost thaw will affect global climate, the first question we need to know is just how much carbon is in permafrost. Um, there's a lot, there's 1500 billion tons of carbon in permafrost. So if you think about, you know, those losses that we measured at the experiment, that was at one plot, at one space. If you imagine if you multiply that up across the Arctic, um, that represents a really substantial potential source of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Um, okay, so 15 billion tons, it sounds like a big number, and it is, but just to give you some context, um, 15 billion tons, so the bottom right-hand circle, that BT means billion tons, that's how much carbon is in permafrost. Um, that's twice as much carbon as is in the atmosphere. Um, three times more carbon as is in the world's forests. So every tree on the planet, there's three times more carbon stored in permafrost than in those trees. And it's more or on par with our current estimate of fossil fuel reserves. So this is really important carbon source and it's one of the largest vulnerable carbon pools on the planet. And by vulnerable, I mean it potentially can be released into the atmosphere. Um, so we know there's a lot of carbon that's stored in permafrost. Um, it's frozen right now. Some of it will be thawed as a result of climate change and some of that will be released to the atmosphere. So this question is, that's the big question is just how much will be released to the atmosphere? Because it's not going to thaw and then automatically go to the atmosphere. There's microbial processes that needs to be broken down and then released. Um, our current estimate is that 150 billion tons will be released to the atmosphere um, by 2100. And, and that important note is that's under what we call business as usual. So if we continue releasing greenhouse gases and continue on our warming trajectory, we can expect 150 billion tons. And that's on par with our US emissions. So 150 tons by 2100, if you divide that by, you know, assuming, you know, the number of years to 2100, that's about the, similar to the US emissions, which is about 1.4 um, per year. Okay, so this is a substantial carbon source into the atmosphere. Um, and one of the concerns about this is it's currently not incorporated into the global climate models. And so it's really important to communicate um, the emissions of carbon dioxide and methane um, from permafrost to policymakers. And, you know, this is some of the work that I and colleagues did in, in the Paris, um, the climate conference in Paris, the COP, um, asking the question, can we stay below two degrees Celsius warming? Um, and, and I don't know an answer to that. I, you know, I, I, hope, I hope we can, but I will say that we need to account for these permafrost carbon emissions if we want to meet our global emissions targets, right? So we're currently, you know, policymakers are trying to set all these targets to keep global temperature below a two degrees Celsius increase. But we have these emissions from permafrost, which are quite substantial, that currently, currently aren't going in the bookkeeping. Right, so it's like trying to balance your checkbook, but not accounting for you know some you know hundreds of dollars that are being automatically removed from your account, and it's just not going to work out. Um, okay, so that is a little bit of a a little bit of a kind of a not a very optimistic um, ending to this. So one thing I want to point out is that um, carbon dioxide and methane are global greenhouse gases. So what that means is that they're globally mixed. So emissions of carbon dioxide from, um, you know, from the lower 48 of the US or from other parts of the country impact the Arctic, right? And emissions from carbon dioxide from the Arctic also impacts everyone else on the planet. Um, but what it also means is that little actions that, or big actions that we take wherever we are on the planet um, will also reduce carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And then in turn, that will protect the carbon that's stored in permafrost. So I just like to bring up some things that we all can do. First is reducing our carbon footprint. So we're having this meeting online. We're not all flying in from different parts of the world to meet. And that's really important because it's, it's having a big impact on, on reducing each of our carbon footprint and collectively our carbon footprint. Um, plant a tree, protect forests. I mean, when I was a kid, there was a big campaign to plant a tree and, and I don't hear it as much. And we weren't thinking about it then um, in terms of carbon, I don't think. Um, but, you know, you plant a tree and trees take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. And I think this is something we really can 
um, work to sort of bring back as, as an activity and to promote um, um, more broadly. Um, spread the word about climate change and talk to people. And we all have people in our families and friends and who, who aren't as informed about climate change and don't know about the Arctic and permafrost. And so start a conversation. You know, people believe their friends and their colleagues more than they, they will listen to scientists that they don't know. Um, training the ge next generation. There are many on the call who are teachers, and so they're already doing that. And you know, this is a, this top picture is me with some high school students who came to Alaska with me, and I work a lot with undergraduates um, because you know, just work in the Arctic and, and globally, there's a lot of kind of global issues to contend with, and we sort of need these bright, young, and energetic minds. Um, vote and talk to your policymakers. Particularly important in the U.S., but I'd say it's important everywhere. Um, and be informed and you know everyone's doing that by, by jo joining in on this meeting um, and then I just put a link to um, the Woods Hole Research Center webpage that has some other suggestions for what we can all do and there's also information on different types of research that we do here at the center which might be of interest um, and so with that I'm going to end my presentation and I'm not sure are we going to take questions now or, or go over to John do you have we have a moment for some questions can you okay. hear me Sue? Yes, I can. Okay, one of the questions posed by Deborah was, will they start to include permafrost melting and increased CO2 in future climate models? Yeah, so that's the goal. Um, it's, you know, it is in some climate models, but it wasn't in the climate models that informed the, um, the IPCC report, which is the Intergovernmental Panel, I mean, uh, I, Panel on climate change. So this is the report that informed policymakers who are making decisions about um, about their emissions. So it wasn't in that, not because people didn't know about it, but it's really challenging to go from data collected at a field site and putting that into a model. So there are some models that have now, Earth, and they call them Earth system models, that have now started to incorporate permafrost thaw and carbon emissions from permafrost. Um, but I will say that a recent paper that came out, um, a number of models, you know, incorporated permafrost, and um, there's a lot of variability in the model outputs. So there's still a lot of work to do to kind of teach the models the processes that are important. And some of the big complications are fire. So fire is really important, and it's tricky to put this into a model. It results in a direct compression of carbon dioxide, but it also has these long-term effects on permafrost. Um, there's also abrupt processes like ground collapse that are pretty tricky to put in the model. So there is a large permafrost carbon network. It's pretty much you know hundreds of scientists internationally who are, whose end goal is to put you know permafrost carbon emissions into these global climate models. Okay, thank you. I've got a couple other questions. Betsy wanted to know, in carbon calculations, are you talking about just CO2 going into the atmosphere, or are you taking into account CH4? Yeah, so we're talking about both carbon dioxide and methane, and so um, the, the research that I showed you was just carbon dioxide. We also me measured methane there, and I will tell you methane increased in the plots that warmed and it mostly increased because the ground collapsed and it got very, very wet. So that's another important thing when you, we have this ice melting and ground collapse. And this is another reason why it's really hard to put in models because um, you know when permafrost thaws, it doesn't just get warm, but it changes the whole ecosystem. So knowing how much will come out as carbon dioxide and methane is one of the big questions in the sort of Arctic um, carbon cycling community. Um, those estimates of how much carbon will be released um, from permafrost, that currently does not separate into carbon dioxide or methane. So that is just a rough, of course, estimate of that about 10% of that carbon will be released. Um, and we know that some portion of that will come out as methane, but, it, but that's a, somewhat of an uncertainty, just how much. And methane is really important, um, as you may know, because it has a higher global warming potential than carbon dioxide, so it absorbs more of the sun's radiation, so it's a more potent greenhouse gas. Um, it has a shorter lifetime in the atmosphere, but and you get less um, release of methane, but it becomes more important because it's more potent. Okay, there's one another question from Betsy. She asks, if in Project Drawdown, one of the possible solutions is repopulating Mammoth Step to reduce carbon. Have you seen that? Yeah, so um, where I work in Siberia, that um, field station is run by um, a couple of families. One of them is the Zemoffs, and the Zemoffs also started um, this Pleistocene Park. 
Um, and that's and and we visited Pleistocene Park quite a bit. And the goal um, of that, the idea behind that, is that there was this mammoth set ecosystem, and now the ecosystem in this area is large forest. And um, the scientists um, hypothesize that you know with with the removal of mammoths, um, in, in large part because of hunting, um, and removal of these very large herbivores, this has allowed the system to switch to large forests. These mammoth step ecosystems stored a lot more carbon below ground and protected the permafrost. So the goal is to bring back large herbivores and to see if this will bring back the mammoth step and, and protect the permafrost for a number of different reasons. There are a number of different um, processes that result in colder temperatures with, with these herbivores there. Um, and my thoughts on that are, I, I think it's intriguing and I definitely think that wildlife interact um, with below ground processes, so how much carbon is stored and with ground thermal dynamics, um, and they've seen it in this experiment. I think it's a really um, challenging thing to do. The Arctic is so large and it's so vast and most of it, is, much of it is so inaccessible um, that I would prefer to um, keep the carbon that's in the permafrost now by, to me it seems like, even though it seems like so hard to get countries to agree on fossil fuel emissions, it seems to me way easier to get countries to um, decrease fossil fuel emissions than it does to um, repopulate the Arctic with woolly mammoths. Okay, thank you. Any other questions before we switch to John? Thank you, Sue. I learned so many new things. It was wonderful. Okay, so I think we'll switch over to John's screen. And there we go. It should happen momentarily, John. Okay. You need to unmute your microphone and go ahead and take over whenever you're ready, John. Okay, thank you. Can you hear me now? Okay. Absolutely wonderful. I'm gonna mute myself, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. He keeps going back and forth. So, uh, first off, I'd like to, uh, you know, thank PEI and uh, especially Sue uh, for being here tonight and uh, putting this all together. And I think this is really worthwhile and some really important conversations that need to be had, as well as I'd like to thank everybody that's taking part in this poll, uh, masterclass this evening. I think this is fantastic. And we're hoping that the interest in these grow uh, as, as time goes on. Uh, so I'm John Wood, I'm a teacher. I teach science uh, at Talbert Middle School in uh, Fountain Valley, just next to Huntington Beach in California. And so I'm, I'm pretty much an established Southern California boy. Uh, I've been teaching for about 28 years. And uh, I'm one of the lead teachers in the STEM program at my school. Uh, I go ahead and I coordinate the science fair program, which is really active these days. We just had it. And I build on the polar connections that I've made through the years uh, to help my students understand better how the world works and what kind of connections need to be understood between different ecosystems on the planet. Now we're not just all living in our own little bubbles. So I, I work very hard at that. And I've got to say that over the past seven years, uh, Sue has been a fantastic supporter and mentor and uh, just friend to me. Uh, it's been a wonderful experience and I've learned so much and gotten to experience so many things with her. I'll, I'll share some of that along the way, but I never can thank Sue enough. So, um, I became interested in uh, polar research quite a while ago and completely by accident. But I've got to tell you that it really changed my life. In 1978, I had just graduated from uh, uh, Chapman University and I was, had sort of plans on becoming a, a researcher and getting into science and marine biology was my thing. And I was uh, trying to get very focused on that. 
and an opportunity came up to go to the Antarctic. And honestly, I, I, I'd never thought or said the word Antarctica in my life. I don't think I'd ever thought of the poles at that point. But you can't turn down a good opportunity. And I thought that it would be a good chance for me to meet some researchers and possibly get in on somebody's program and try to find a direction there. So I went down to Antarctica and I spent the season at McMurdo Station and uh, did meet some researchers quite a few, and did have some fantastic experiences. Uh, this is just one of the shots. Uh, this is Mount Erebus. that is the world's southernmost active volcano on the planet at about 12,400 feet with the Barn Glacier that is poured down off of it coming out onto the uh, McMurdo Sound. That's the ocean we're standing on. And you can see there's a little, my, my boss is standing there ne up next to the glacier just for a little bit of scale. Uh, I fell in love with the ice. I fell in love with Antarctica. I fell in love with everything about it. And it, it really did change my life. So that one season turned into nine seasons. And I ended up being the uh, laboratory facilities manager and the research dive officer for the United States program in the Antarctic. Uh, and just just had a fantastic time learning and seeing and working with hundreds of projects uh, out in the field and under the water uh, and just having the time of my life. Well, uh, eventually that had to come to an end and I uh, decided to come back to California. But, you know, I really had a huge passion for the polls and sharing that information. And at that point was the first time in my life that I thought that, you know, maybe I've got enough information and experience to go into a classroom and share it and and try to make some kind of difference. And so I became a teacher. Uh, and it, it, it's been a fantastic experience. I, I lucked out here because teaching has been a way for me to connect with the kids, connect with the communities and connect with the science. Uh, which is really the best of all worlds for me. Uh, when you add the fact that I've been able to get out into the field, it, it just it's just gravy. So that's worked out very nice. Well, I taught for about 15 years before I got the opportunity. Uh, but after that, I decided that I needed to go back to the polar regions. So in 2008, I uh, became associated with a project from New Mexico Tech and spent six weeks going back to McMurdo and living on top of Mount Erebus, uh, doing some tomography studies, trying to map the inside of the volcano and learning all about the geology and seeing things that, you know, the previous nine years that I'd been down there, I never really had the opportunity to see. So that was spectacular. This was all associated with the IPY, the International Polar Year, that happened in 2007, 2008. Uh, everybody was talking polar at that time. Education was being pushed, and I wanted to be part of that. So I jumped in, and it's, it's worked out fantastically well. That was going fantastically, and then to make things even better, I, in 2011, I had the great fortune of meeting Sue Natale. And this is one, this is, was, was through Polar Trek. Uh, so we were matched up as a researcher teacher pair. Uh, I, again, I, I didn't know a thing about Tundra <laughs> at that point. I had not been in the Arctic at that point. And uh, I was pretty much having to start all over again with a lot of this. But Sue, was wonderful about sharing her experience and her information and her science with me. And in the time that we spent in the field, we developed what I feel was a really uh, efficient working relationship. And I think uh, what really struck me, and I think both of us the most after the first season or so, was the fact that, you know, uh, I knew the teaching. I, I knew what the kids needed 
as far as trying to make those connections and uh, put it in a way that those kids could relate to things. And Sue knew her science. And when we got together and started really talking from both ends and working out, uh, you know, approaches to this sort of uh, outreach situation, uh, it, it just happened uh, fantastically well. Sue was very eager to learn. Uh, and as she stated before, she's, she's really focused on education. And so she pushed me a lot. And I, it was all I had to do was keep up with her. But we took off and that worked out extremely well. Uh, in the time that I worked in Healy with her, and that was uh, two times in the summer, and one time I, I had the opportunity to work with her grad student, Elizabeth Webb, during uh, some of the winter, uh, we went ahead and we connected with the Tri-Valley schools just outside, well, they're in Healy, but just outside of the uh, research uh, station where we were, or our facility. And we had their sixth and seventh and eighth graders come on out to our field. They did a field trip. They got to uh, measure um, the tundra. We showed them the apparatus and we got them involved with uh, the science that was really going on in their backyard. And that was cool because the kids knew the area. They could tell you stories and they'd been out there playing and doing things, but they really didn't understand, you know, what was going on around them. So they jumped in and learned a bunch uh, during those experiences. And then Sue was gracious enough to uh, come over to my school in California on several occasions, bring her instruments, and we did it all over again with my kids in California. And we got the kids up to speed with what Tundra is and the concept of measuring the carbon dioxide and learning about respiration, decomposition, and photosynthesis and how these uh, factors affect uh, climate and the atmosphere. Well, we ended up getting these kids together, uh, sort of pen pal activities and exchanging data and uh, just having a good time with that. And uh, that still goes on to uh, uh, some degree these days. So it's been going on for quite a while. Along with that, I had the opportunity to work with uh, teachers in Alaska and through Sioux and through Polar Trek. Uh, I went ahead and got involved in the uh, uh, Alaska Geographic uh, educational program and that's run through Denali National Park and got to spend a couple of weeks with researchers and teachers and going through all of the stuff that is going on in the national park there and sharing information. And then Sue and I have even visited the library in Healy and a few places and done some talks and uh, trying to get the community to uh, engage in what's going on uh, in the area. And those folks are pretty engaged. So it, it's been a really nice set of, set of circumstances there. <clears throat> uh, over the following years, working with Sue and uh, with her encouragement and then with PEI and with Polar Trek, I've been able to get out and try to further the research and the uh, outreach efforts. Uh, I've had opportunities to travel up to Alaska several times uh, for different opportunities. The Math and Science Alaskan State Conference, uh, we went up there and did a, did a presentation for them. You can see off to the right there, we actually had teachers looking at Tundra in a little pail there and learning how to frame point and take on uh, different types of ways to measure uh, the biomass in the tundra and look at the different species. We've had kids develop sort of games and activities. We've taken part in several uh, uh, field trips and uh, online studies at the Museum of the North at the University uh, in Fairbanks. And uh, Sue has been able to get some of her uh, grad students over into my classroom to share with my kids in California again. 
and my kids do polar projects and we're talking to folks and even my seventh graders uh, get hooked up with uh, graduate students that Sue has and uh, they do joint projects together where the kids need to actually learn the science and the personal uh, biography of the grad students and really get to know what those people, those young people, uh, have gone through and how they got to where they are and what their plans are. Hopefully that's igniting some of the, uh, you know, future researchers and my kids uh, and they will find those opportunities. So it's all been very good and we've been trying to find outreach avenues at every turn. Uh, the, in this last year, I uh, Sue, through Sue's uh, uh, support, I ended up being invited as a panel speaker at the White House uh, Ministerial uh, Climate event that was hosted by the White House. This was a side event that was put on by ARCUS, the Arctic Research Consortium of the United States, and through the National Science Foundation. But we, I got to sit on a panel with uh, ministers from uh, many, uh, many of the Arctic countries, including Norway and Russia and Canada and several others, and got to speak to the public and got to speak to, uh, you know, the research community and try to get the outreach word out there and uh, try to make people understand how important this is. It's been some great opportunities. And, uh, you know, if you're willing to uh, push and look, there are many, many, many opportunities out there. And with the support, uh, anything is possible. Uh, the last few years, we've uh, uh, been able to take students and engage them in poster presentations and oral presentations at the International uh, American, well, it's the American Geophysical Union Conference or meeting in San Francisco. Typically, it's it's been moving around lately. but. Uh, through the Polaris project, I was able to go and share the stage with some of the real stars as far as the undergrad st students that came with us and just learned so much and, and got so excited about it. And as well, over the last few years, I've been able to get some of my uh, middle school students and a few high school students to AGU. And now they have been making presentations and meeting the scientists and getting a real taste of what it takes and what it's like to be in a really uh, dense research community. And it's been phenomenal. Some of these kids, the changes you see in them have just been staggering. Uh, and it, it's just so neat to watch these young people go on to, uh, you know, get focused and go on to better things. So again, I, I can't say enough about the opportunities that have come up and how Sue has supported all of this. Uh, it's been quite the time of my life and I would recommend it to anybody. So that's been fantastic. And we've been trying to get the word out and I've been trying to learn more and more as we go. Uh, at my school in particular, uh, we just in December, uh, in conjunction with Antarctica Day, which is December 1st, we began having our Polar Day celebrations for the Fountain Valley School District. Uh, like I say, this was our third year. We had over 2,500 people attend these celebrations this year. And the celebrations have just been wonderful. They include uh, booths with activities that range from pre-K all the way up to uh, eighth grade and really some high school activities that are all centered around uh, polar sort of themes. We, uh, this year we had the Anaheim Ducks come and set up a little uh, apparatus so people could uh, experience uh, ice skating. And it was, it was really cool. We have food and everything, but we also feature researchers and community uh, STEM people at the uh, Polar Day celebration. And Sue has, graced our stage there uh, at least once, and I know we'll get her back again, uh, and spoken to the public. So the public has a chance to come in and listen to working, acting researchers and get firsthand 
uh, the information about the research that they are conducting and, uh, you know, really begin to understand what's going on in the science community. Because through my experience, it's a lot different uh, filter hearing the researchers talk about it than most people get through a media uh, outlet or through a political sort of filter where things get fairly skewed and uh, get pretty heated. You know, hearing the researchers talk about their passions and their work and actually looking at the data that they've collected, you really get a, a good sense of what's going on. And I think it's much, much better information. So that's been fantastic. And we're going to keep it going. OK, well, I have a couple of things to share. And these are activities that Sue and I have worked on. And mostly I've just stolen a bunch of stuff that Sue does. <laughs> and again, tried to adapt it for the students and for the public to go ahead and use and get engaged with. So the first activity that I will talk about here is what Sue and I uh, call the Global Decomposition Project. Now, what you're looking at is, is one of the posters that we shared at AGU. I will tell you now that the complete uh, protocol for this activity will be in the uh, Google community for you to have. And it's uh, much more detailed than you're seeing on the screen. This is just a brief sort of uh, cut down summary of, of what the activity is. So if this whole thing doesn't make total sense to you, that's okay. The complete uh, protocol will be online for you to use and it's, it's very detailed about how to conduct this, how to make the decomposition bags, and, and how to go ahead and, and get the data from this. But what it basically is, is when I was in Alaska, uh, amongst other things, I realized that Sue was uh, taking these decomposition measurements in the soil. And she started talking about decomposition bags. OK, what's a decomposition bag? Well, basically what it is, is a piece of screen that's, you know, approximately, uh, you know, 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters, and they can be various sizes. And inside of that screen, you place a piece of cellulose paper. Now, before you put it into the screen, you go ahead and weigh that paper and get a dry weight for the paper. And then by placing it in the screen, you fold it over and make a little bag with the paper inside. And then you install the screen into the soil. And it's not clear on this, but you can see over here on the left, there's that little pink flag. That's one of the uh, decomposition bags that we stuck in for the Talbert kids that was up in Alaska. Uh, we also stuck them in the ground at Talbert in California and did some comparison studies that you can see the data there. But you leave the bags in the ground and for a certain time. And I'll tell you, <laughs> it was quite the eye opener because uh, I had done this with Sue up in Alaska and she leaves the bags in for six months, a year, sometimes over a year. And, uh, you know, the bags, uh, there's still plenty of cellulose paper left after those times for us to clean and dry and weigh. So the first time that I brought this back to my kids in California, we went ahead and made up some bags and we chose some areas around the school grounds to go ahead and start our testing. And we put a series of bags in the ground and we talked about it and I let them chew it over and they decided that, mm, you know, we'll leave these bags in the ground for about three weeks. And I thought, okay, that's reasonable. Maybe we'll put an extra one in and check it at two weeks. Uh, just to see what's going on. Well, by the end of two weeks, we pulled our test bag out and the paper was gone. It was just totally gone. The thing had been picked clean and it was all decomposed. So, and obviously the rest of them were the same way. So we had to readjust that. So as far as the time that is needed for uh, having these in the ground, it's gonna vary. And it's gonna vary dependent on your situation, uh, the soil, humidity, the moisture in the soil, temperatures, things like that. And, but that's all part of the learning experience here. 
that's all part of looking at the different components of decomposition in the soil and getting the kids to focus on really what's going on. Uh, I've had kids now use these bags as science fair projects. And uh, a few years ago, I had a child uh, use this as a multi-year project and do a whole set of data that she presented at the science fair. And it turned out to be a real nice project. <clears throat> this is something that you can choose uh, anywhere around the school grounds or anywhere in your community. And you can test a lot of different uh, variables just around your school as far as moisture and soil composition and uh, temperature and things like that. So it's it's been some really good activities. And depending on what I want to use it for and how I can plug it into my curriculum, uh, you know, the kids can design their own experiments and uh, discover all kinds of kinds of things there. So that's going to be online in its entirety, including instructions on how to make your own bags and a pretty detailed uh, uh, list of materials and everything else. Uh, and also there's uh, uh, contact information there for Sue and myself uh, if you end up uh, having questions or if you do get some data that you want to share. Because ultimately that is the goal, is to get enough data in enough areas to start sharing and looking at patterns. Okay, now the next activity that I would like to share is a little bit more of a um, open-ended sort of activity. Now this is, uh, as you can see, titled uh, Carbon Balance and Warming and Drying Tundra. This is based strictly off of the work that Sue is doing, was doing in Healy, Alaska. And as you can see there, I'm kneeling in front of some of the chambers, the warming chambers, and some of the plots there that we worked in for seasons. And we started looking at the uh, data that was coming from the instruments and looking at the levels of carbon dioxide. And I know for my seventh graders in California, we look at photosynthesis, we talk about respiration, uh, we look at those sort of processes from a chemical point of view and from an ecology point of view. And I thought, wow, okay, here's another opportunity to use real data in a situation that we can uh, not only collect around our school ourselves, but we can take this researcher's data from other locations and we can look at what's going on in Alaska. We can look at what's going on in Siberia and we can make comparisons and we can draw conclusions from those comparisons. So this has worked out pretty nicely for me. And I've used this activity with students. I've used this activity with teachers in teacher groups and they have a ball with this. Uh, and I've used this in public settings uh, with just people walking in off the street who, you know, have a wide variety of knowledge as far as all this goes. And that's <laughs> that's been kind of a hit or miss depending on how motivated they are about that. But teachers love this kind of thing. So what the activity really centers around are these graphs. And the graph that you see is a measurement of the carbon dioxide from one of the chambers in Healy. Now there is a set of 15 of these graphs that represent basically a 24 hour period of sampling. And as you can see there, the box, uh, the uh, warming chamber closes about every 90 minutes and it will take a sampling of the uh, gases in the chamber uh, and then record that. So, you get an idea of what a cycle would look like. And in, in, uh, in realistically, what you're looking at is what Sue was talking about before, the microbial activity in the soil, uh, representing the respiration, which will be releasing carbon dioxide into the atmosphere and into the chamber, the gases in the chamber as opposed to the photosynthesis that is going on inside the chamber and plants photosynthesizing, pulling in that carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. 
So, and the kids have a tough time sort of making that connection if they're not familiar, uh, real familiar with the carbon dioxide, with the photosynthesis uh, cycle and, and a little bit more with the respiration. So as you look at the graphs, not only do you get a level of carbon dioxide on the uh, y-axis on the left, but you also get a trend through the uh, sampling that's going on through the 240 seconds as to whether it's going up, staying the same, going down. So the graphs uh, all are changing. And when you put these graphs in order, you can see the cycle. You can see the change in carbon dioxide from uh, when the sun is up and when the sun is down, primarily, is what these will show. So the graph will move up, move up and down as well as the level of carbon dioxide will move up and down. And all 15 of these graphs will also be online with a uh, sort of a lesson plan with them suggesting some of the uses that you can use these for. So you will have the graphs. Uh, I will state right here before I forget that the graphs that you will get online, each graph will have the day and the time that that data was taken. So right in the graph, it'll say like May 1st, and it will say at 1.20 a.m. And then the next one will say at 3.40 or whatever it's going to be. And they'll all have a timestamp. Uh, what I do for my activities, and it says this in the outline, is I take those timestamps off when I'm uh, giving it to the kids at times and to the adults and let them sort of hash out what the patterns should really look like and what the pattern's going to be. Okay, I mean, that may be obvious. I just thought I'd say that. So, uh, I use what's called the 5E model quite often as far as my lesson plans, and I'm confident that most everybody's heard of that, but just in case, the 5E format is uh, a way of setting up your lessons uh, either a single lesson or for a uh, entire section of lessons if you're covering a, a module and what it represents is the five sections of the learning so the first e would be engage the second e would be explore the third e is explain the fourth hello, yeah fourth e is extend and then the fifth e is evaluate so what I find is I have interjected this activity, these uh, graphs, into several different areas of that sort of lesson planning. There are times when I will use this as an explorer. If I have students who I have covered the you know, photosynthesis respiration cycles with and they're fairly familiar with that, then I can use this as an explorer uh, practice. I can use this as an explain to help uh, give them more depth and a application for what we're looking at as far as real data. And then at other times, I will use this as an evaluate. So once we've completed the lesson, I may give them a challenge to where their part of their final grade is based on being able to put these graphs in a logical sequence and be able to explain what is going on in terms of respiration, photosynthesis, and as far as carbon dioxide levels. They can even talk about uh, the sun cycle as far as when it's up, when it's down, and, and what's going on there. And it can get pretty interesting. The kids get into this way. Um, along with that, I pose some questions for them. And this is just a sampling of questions. Uh, they can be extended way beyond this. But questions for your group, and, and you can read those. So looking at the processes that are affecting the graph, uh, you can extend that to environmental factors. And then you take that a step further and OK. And this is what Sue is, the, the heart of Sue's research, is OK, fine. Then if the atmosphere is warming, and if things are changing, then what are we looking at? Is the tundra going to go from a sink to a source? And literally, and I'll back up here a second, you can quantitize this data uh, by graph 
and you can make this quite the little math activity and have them try to calculate whether this is a sink or a source situation by uh, looking at the graphs individually and then taking a, a culmination of, of the data. And again, it's, it's a really interesting project uh, and can be taken a lot of different ways. So I'm looking forward to getting some feedback and some questions and some good ideas from everybody out there on these activities uh, so that we can change them and make them better and have them evolve into something that even more people can use. So please don't be shy about that. Okay? Okay. Thank well, you, John. Thank yeah. you. I've got a few questions. Are you ready? Okay. Um, Betsy wanted to know, what kind of instrumentation did you use in the field to measure CO2? And she mentioned LICOR question mark. Yeah. And yeah, she's, she's hit it on the head. Sue uses a LICOR instrument. And I can't remember exactly what model it is, uh, but I'm sure she does. <laughs> uh, and it's a gas analyzer that she puts in her brains uh, in the setup that will sample uh, for this particular one. Uh, we're just looking at the carbon dioxide or we were looking at the carbon dioxide. OK, great. She also mentioned that she was glad the polar bear and the penguin uh, were not standing together, that they were separated by a researcher or a student. OK. Got a, I got a question, a few questions from Kim. She said, given all of your experiences, what are some of the most effective activities you've done in the classroom or as part of outreach, um, activities to break misconceptions, interactives, inquiry-based, uh, mini experiments? Hold on. She, um, for example, best ways to translate research into the classroom. Oh, she said her questions got answered. So it looks like you've answered those as part of your talk. Oh, okay. Unless there's well, anything else you'd like to add about any other activities you've done, uh, not just maybe related to tundra, but maybe some of the other Antarctic or Arctic science. Sure. Uh, you know, uh, that's an interesting question. And, you know, to address Betsy, yes, we, we stress highly that penguins and polar bears are not going to be found together uh, at polar days. So that's that's why that picture was taken. Anyway. So, you know what I find, I have found over the years is there are some real simple activities out there, activities that at first glance a lot of people would pass up. But you know what? When you get people that look like they're interested, I find that identifying their misconceptions. So a lot of the times I'll even start with a little survey. I'll give them a question questionnaire, maybe a little fun game just to read and talk with their buddies and, and fill it out and answer the questions and find out what they really know or what they think they know and where they're really off. And then there are a gaggle of very simple activities that will address things like, you know, ice and density and uh, albedo and uh, all kinds of issues that come up in the uh, polar regions that a lot of people are not really aware of. Uh, and uh, I'd be more than happy to share some more of that. And I think during the discussion period, that would be a good time for people to ask about different activities and a good time for those of us who've worked in polar science and classrooms to share things with the audience. Mm -hmm. Okay, one more question. Betsy asked, uh, we have schools that are installing rainwater harvesting basins in Arizona, and they are monitoring soil. Do you have good ideas for them, oops, I just skipped, for them to measure carbon, moisture in soil, and compare? to not rain basins? Hmm. It's a good question. I guess I'd have to think about that. <laughs> okay, well maybe that question can be asked on the Google community and people that are listening to the webinar tonight or as an archive, you know, ask your questions, share your own um, activities in your classroom. Look at previous master classes on the PEI website. There's a lot of material there, a lot of good science presentations coupled with educator presentations to really show how, how this is being done in classrooms around the world. Okay, let me just go back to sharing the presenter. Okay. 
So thank you for taking part in the master class. I'm going to go back to the reminders to join the community and take part in the discussion forum. Um, if you have not watched the live webinar, then you're likely listening to this as an archive. Int introduce yourself in the discussion forum. That's a way for us to get to know who you are and where you are and what you do and what your experience level is. And then don't forget to complete the post survey for the master class. Thank you everybody um, for taking part tonight and we'll look forward to hearing from you in the discussion forum. Have a good night. Thanks, John and Sue. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, good night, everyone. <laughs>